Hi everyone. Welcome to another episode of Another Diamond at Your Box. Today, my guest is a San Diego-based uh, <clears throat> musician, um, Dre Trouble, or Andre Carrera Ponce, but he goes by Dre Trouble. Hi, Dre. How are you? Doing great, thanks. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks good, for thanks. being on my show. Thanks for having me. And yeah, no problem. Yes, yeah, so <clears throat> you and I met. When was it the first time that we hung out? It was two years ago. Oh, you remember exactly, huh? Yeah, That's great. It, yeah, it was about two years ago. And it was when you were playing with the Falling Doves at the Viper Bay. I think in like July of um, 2021. Right. I think you're right. Yeah, that thing that was. Yeah, that was the first time that we like officially, you know, hung out in person. But we talked online like way before that. I think, well, not that much earlier, but maybe like a few times. Well, a few months. Sorry, a few months. <laughs> so yeah. So hmm. so you have played with the Falling Doves and right. Are currently a frontman for um, Jagged Lines, as well That's as right. a bassist for the Brown Party Liquor String Band. <laughs> That's right. Kind of my local project, yeah. Both based in San Diego. So, at what right. age did you become inspired to become a musician? That's a good question. Um, yeah, I became interested in playing. When I was about 10 years old, I heard Albert King do uh, Roadhouse Blues. And that's when it that's when it was over. I had to do I had to do that. Um, whatever it was that man was doing, I needed to be a part of that right away. Uh, and so I begged my mom for about two years to get me a guitar. And she said no for a while. Finally, I nagged her enough that she was like, all right, fine, I'm going to get you a guitar. But if I'm going to get you a guitar, you're going to learn to play real music. And uh, being a Spaniard, what that meant was classical guitar or flamenco. Mm -hmm. So um, I got classical and flamenco lessons, which I hated at first. But now I'm super grateful that um, that I did that because I, I got some of the harder stuff out of the way. And it actually paved the way for me to learn a lot of um, great, not only guitar stuff, but also um, bass technique. So that was pretty, pretty exciting. All at the age of 12 when I really started. So I see. Wow. So, well, good for you for sticking it out with, you know, all of the classical training. Because I remember that when I was um, 12 years old, I think it was like 11 or 12, my, mm -hmm. mother, my mother played piano when she was um, a kid. And she actually plays quite skillfully. And she still sometimes did that um, back when I was in middle school. That was the last time that she played like, a lot. In middle school. So oh, wow. Before she got to do the book. And around the time when I was um, like 11 or so, I think, she tried to teach me how to play, but I just could not take it after like the young because I just, um, I found it boring. I found it way too boring. And my mom's <laughs> music i never really was and i didn't become right inspired to actually make this vocals until i was more so good for you for you know sticking it out at such an early age wow and so thanks so stubborn i guess that <laughs> was so your first instrument was uh you learned classical guitar um, right at age 10. nice so have you always been a musician or did you try other jobs first? Like did you have to take any other career paths before you became before you became like a full time musician? Ah, uh, that's a really that's a really great question. Um yeah, I've always um to be honest, I've only really been um I guess I, I guess I could say a full time musician, um just really for the last six years. Um even though I've been I've been a musician since I was a kid. I, I worked in, I worked as a financial advisor uh, uh, when I first got out of college. I worked as a broker, um, stockbroker for a while. Uh, and I worked as a banker, I worked as an insurance agent, I worked as 
um, underwriting for a bit or an underwriter for a bit. And then uh, I just got tired of it. I just thought, you know, if I'm really going to do this, I'm really going to do this. So um, I kind of just, I kind of just jumped all in uh, back in 2017. Um, and, and it's been great. It's been the best decision ever, really, because uh, I just have more time, more time for the things I, I want to do, uh, more time for gigs, more time for shows, and more time for, for songwriting. I see. Well, <laughs> wow. So you have definitely tried um, other careers just so that you could, uh, you know, make money, make money. Um, for right. Time. And how old are you, if you don't mind my asking? <laughs> I'm 41. Oh, I see. Wow. So, well, you're definitely an inspiration. Because if you were willing to follow your dream, even after you've been working in other like completely different fields for such a long time, it's, I mean, it definitely says a lot. And so, yes. well, you're an inspiration. What else can I say? Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> it's tough out there, so... <laughs> Sure is. Yeah, definitely sure is. Um, and like with music, especially in LA, well, I mean, not necessarily just in LA, but in so many other places, it's, it's definitely really, really competitive. And, you know, these days, unfortunately, you have to try like really extra hard to keep rock and roll alive. Right, absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's one of the biggest things too, is, is specifically uh, for rock and roll, you know, you're doing it for rock and roll a lot of the time. Um, it's 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 different being a musician than anything else, really, because whatever else you're doing isn't doesn't have the same urgency. Because you you do, you're right. You kind of nailed it with that. Um, you got to keep rock and roll alive. You know, it's a beautiful thing that we love a lot, and uh, it's if we're not doing it, no one's doing it. You know. Yeah, it's really really important to be passionate about what you do because. I have tried working in client sales mm -hmm. last November, and for a while it's been good. I lasted there for almost a year, for 11 months to be exact. And okay. for a while I was kind of like able to, you know, have this double life where I would have a day job doing something that's like completely different from like what I consider my passion. I mean, not to say that I didn't enjoy my day job because I did. Sure. But at the end of the day, when things didn't work out with that position, it really forced me to like take a look at what I really want to do and just be like, well, rock and roll was my passion. I want to become a music blogger. I want to be a music artist. And so right. I started going to school to get my associates in journalism. And from now on, I'm going to be fully focused on just being on the path to working in a field where that I'm really passionate about. Like no more day jobs and that it obviously you have to pay the bills, but I think that at the end of the day, <laughs> you're like, you have to start doing what you love right now. Because like, it's like, hmm. there's just yeah. no way that I can put it in the back room. Um, How many instruments do you play in total? Uh, so I play, um, I play electric bass, electric guitar, and I play, um, upright bass. So even though electric bass and upright bass is pretty similar, it almost feels like it's two different instruments because it's a little bit more work, um, to play upright, but yeah, uh, bass and guitar, mostly singing too. Singing's probably the hardest instrument in a way. Uh, there's so many things you have to do to keep your voice okay. So many things you can't eat <laughs> or drink or whatever. If you're going to be really serious about it, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's definitely true. You have to keep. Do you have any special like regiments or like basically, is there anything that you like to do specifically for yourself to like, keep your voice healthy? Like, do you do exercises? Do you drink any like special drinks or anything? Um, as, um, as a musician, as a singer, uh, I'm kind of, I've been kind of bad. I, I don't, um, I don't take as many precautions as I ought to, you know, I, I smoke a little bit pot, not cigarettes, but, um, and, uh, I, um, you know, I, I sometimes eat spicy food and things like that, but on, on like the day of a gig, you have to avoid spicy food, citrus, you have to avoid 
uh, milk and dairy uh, right before you, <laughs> you start singing. So um, it's just things that will complicate your voice and rob you of a little bit of your longevity and your range and all that. So, um, yeah, just, you know, the day of. Um, but to be honest, really, I don't, not too many, not too many regiments other than that. Just trying to not self-sabotage, if that's really a kind of regimen. Yeah, my voice teacher told me a few months ago that when she was in high school, her vocal coach told her that before she went on stage, she would have a shadow whisper. And it's actually, right. as long as you obviously don't let it become like a regular thing, just mm -hmm. one or two shots of whiskey before you start practicing or before a lesson or before you go on stage because in my personal experience it really does clear up like all of the phlegm your throat and basically right. all of the all of the other like gunk that's in there that's preventing your voice from sounding like clearer and it's best so so just as long as you are not gonna get sucked into it <laughs> it's definitely a good um <clears throat> Yeah, definitely a good trick to hmm. um, how old It's really funny that you mentioned... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Sorry, what were you going to say? Uh, I was going to say, um, it's really funny that you should mention that because um, specifically whiskey was... For, um, for, when, for things when I, when I got started, uh, I was answering that question very honestly because that's the only rituals I have now. But when I started, uh, it was actually... Four shots of whiskey <laughs> before I'd get on stage. Uh, 45 minutes before I got on stage. So that would mean that right when I got on stage, I was ready to really rock. Um, and yeah, you're right. Not only does it kind of soothe your throat a little bit, but um, I just felt like I was on top of the world and I could do anything. So they, it really, the, the adrenaline counteracts the effects of the alcohol a little bit. So you end up, really performing you end up being in this little spot where the alcohol is fighting the the adrenaline and so you're in a you're in a place of believe it or not somewhat somewhat focused um and and it's it's good it really helped me out a lot uh i used to have a little bit of stage fright when i started um singing back in 2010 um i sort of that was the first time i was ever a front man with jagged lines and we went up there the very you know, um, the very first show, and I, you know, I, I was ready. I had my I had my whiskey, but it was it was so um, yeah, it was nerve wracking. Um, and so um, I I just leaned into the whiskey, and <laughs> it's a good thing you said not to get into it too much because I definitely did. Um, and so I lately um, it's not a thing anymore that I do, but I've, I've stopped as of years ago. But um, for a while, the whiskey had a good hold on me for a bit. It was just impossible to perform without it, so. I see. Yeah, well, I can definitely see how it can help you, like, with your stage fright, because the alcohol definitely relaxes you. Like, for me, uh, sure. as long as I, and the main reason why I only try to have, like, the one or two shots is because if I have any more than that, I get too relaxed to a point where I'm, like, not able to really focus or be present or, like, really right. into the because like I'm one of those people like when I get drunk I get into this really really sleepy state and right. it's not it's obviously not a good state to be in when you're performing so right you does it okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> good um, uh, next anyway next question um, how old were you when you were in your first band that's a great question. Um, I was in a band in high school. Uh, let's see. Well, you know, <laughs> so you know, it's really funny. I was in a, I was in a really, um, I was in kind of a terrible project when I was back, back when I was a junior in high school. Uh, so I guess I was uh, about sixteen or seventeen, and um, it wasn't, it wasn't much of a project to be honest. It was just a project that my friend was singing in. I was playing bass for it. We had some synthesizers and some other stuff. It was just it was just a goofball project, and we used to play for parties. Um, uh, um, just that, yeah, just play at parties and stuff on the weekends. And so, um, but we ended up we ended up landing a really really big gig with um, 
I think it was Sebastian Bach's uh, solo project. No way. Uh, which was crazy, you know what I mean? And and <laughs> at the tender age of seventeen, um, and it was it was a terrible project. I felt kind of embarrassed because you know here's Sebastian Bach's like bass player sharing a um, backstage room with me, and uh, <laughs> you know just completing a tour and doing all this great stuff. And meanwhile, we're just these kids from high school just um, singing songs about. Uh, porn and partying and stupid shit like that, and uh, and yeah, we were we we opened up for them, and it turned out yeah, it was a really good show. They were very gracious too, by the way, very super nice people. Sebastian Bach's the nicest dude. Yeah. Even though I didn't get to hang out with him too long, but very nice guy. I wish I met him. Uh, you know, I always see those pictures of him, like sometimes hanging out at the rainbow, and it sucks because whenever I go to the rainbow, like I never. <laughs> saw any of my like favorite rock stars that they're in the flesh well right right i should go on more often because uh, i mean i can't exactly afford to eat fattening food like that on a regular basis because it eventually it would uh you know ruin my waistline <laughs> right people, as much as i love it they have nothing healthy on the menu well wait they do have right salads. maybe they have like a chicken caesar salad or something but that place is not about healthy, but it's, <laughs> it's but you do occasionally see some stuff there for sure. Yeah. It's not about health food. And it's also like, it's kind of expensive. Like honestly, yeah. if, you have, if you're going to be going there, you would drop like 60 bucks on just like sandwich, some fries and a drink. Right. Yeah. I'll bet. I'll bet. I don't end up there as often as I would have liked, but I go every <laughs> once in a while and hopefully... I'll see some celebrities there. But anyway, it's awesome that you got to open up for like Sebastian Bach's uh, band like back when you were 17. Like that's amazing. Oh cool, yeah, it was pretty it was pretty neat. Um yeah, we speaking of the rainbow, did um did we tell you about the time that Chris the last time Chris and I were there, uh we ran into um a really, really drunk young blood and uh, a very in charge Miley Cyrus, fortunately. And Miley was phenomenal about corralling him and getting him to behave, but he was just being a maniac. But yeah, these things things happen. Cyrus, last time you went to the Rainbow with Chris. They, yeah, last time we were at the um, at the Rainbow. Yeah. When was this? I I wasn't there. Like I definitely wasn't there. So. You weren't there. Yeah, it was. Um... It was one. Of, it was one of the last times that we played LA. Not the last time, but uh, I think maybe the the time before that. Um, maybe the second last time that we played LA. So it's been like two years at least. So would you say it was like? Um, maybe maybe of, about a year. Well, maybe maybe about a year and a half. Maybe a little more. Yeah. Wow. Oh my gosh. I seriously <laughs> this would have like called me because um like <laughs> I, I always go to every single one of the falling dust shows when they play in LA and right. I always just assume that like Chris is so busy with whatever he has going on in San Diego or like he soars a lot. Well sometimes like honestly I have trouble keeping up with whatever it is he has going on. And like last time we hung sure. out I texted him like when I you know when I went was going home Hey, like next time you're gonna be in the area, like next time you're in LA, like let me know. We should go and do something. But yeah, I mean, I doubt, uh, next time I see him, I will. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll like. <laughs> yeah, I'm totally gonna scold him a little bit for <laughs> know that you guys were freaking hanging out at the Rainbow with Miley Cyrus, and I'm a few well. Guys. I mean, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go saying that necessarily. I mean, we happened to run into her, and she wasn't hanging out. She was more apologizing for um, Youngblood's terrible behavior, um, and just trying to get him to stop um, harassing security and the staff there because he was uh, standing on a table. Uh, with a beer bottle in his hand, trying to smash all these bulbs oh, that were hanging from a string. <laughs> so he was he was being a little ridiculous, and he wanted to be best friends with me because I was wearing um, I was wearing a uh, Joy Division shirt, and he he's a really big Joy Division fan, which I I didn't know. <laughs> oh my gosh! Well, hopefully I'll get to see Miley in the flesh over there sometime soon. 
I hope so. She's lovely. I hope you get to see her and not not necessarily young blood. <laughs> wow. So Yeah, Miley's awesome. <laughs> I have new respect for her. Oops. Oh. Okay, we're back. Yeah, we cut out though for a second. But we're back. Thank you. Anyway, uh next question. Uh <clears throat> So how many bands have you played in in total, like up until now? Um, There we go. I think now we're good. Okay. Right? Great. Okay, great. So, cool. got that fixed. so anyway. Bands, yeah. Yeah, can you <laughs> please repeat the answer to um, how many bands have you played in total like, up until now? Let's see, four, five, uh, six. Um, man, seven. Eight, nine, ten, um, eleven, twelve. Um, I would say. Oops. Sorry, can you hear me still? I can still hear you. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Trying not to um, try to drop this thing. I think the total is somewhere around. Um, uh, I think it's been sixteen bands that have been that have done like performances and you know have gone out done tours things like that um i think it's about i want to say it's about 16 uh maybe 18 maybe 18 i think is a better number um oh, yeah 18 oh my gosh that's uh, that's definitely a huge number i mean good for you um yeah uh, thanks that's a, a lot a lot of opportunities wow and have all of them been in like the LA, you know, or the San Diego region, or have you ever had to like go, have you ever had to live in other states or like some other places? Yeah, yeah, that's a good, that's a good, great, great question. Um, a few of those were in high school. Um, I was in, um, I was in a couple of bands in high school that used to, um, we started, we started playing around a little bit and people really liked it. So, um, so the first one was kind of like a, kind of like a ska band. Which is kind of funny, um, and then um, and then yeah, I, I toured uh, in another band in the Northeast for a little bit uh, in support of this singer, uh, who was a buddy of mine, and so we we toured uh, New York and New England, so it so that was cool, um, and then I was in another band in upstate New York that was it was a pretty serious project. We had a few we had a few really good gigs, um, and to be honest, that was the band that I was trying to. Um, that I was trying to complete when I moved out to San Diego. Um, it didn't have a name, actually. It was just a project that I had with my my buddy at the time. And when I moved out here, I realized uh, he had kind of lost his creativity. Mm -hmm. So um, he just committed himself to production and producing music, and he'd kind of forgotten all about writing music. Mm -hmm. And so when I got out here after this big dramatic move where I drove across the country and packed all my belongings and um i came out here and just to find out that he sort of lost his creativity so i had to start over again i see wow wow you have definitely been in a lot of projects moved around quite a bit yeah hmm. well good thanks yeah you. it's like you've had so much experience um <clears throat> so and as i mentioned like in the beginning of the of the interview uh you are currently a front man for Jagged Lines, as well yes. as a bass player for the Brown Party Liquor String Band. <laughs> right, guilty as charged. <laughs> How long have you been involved with both projects? 
Um, yeah. So actually just, um, merging from the last thing I said, um, when I, when that project didn't work out back in 2010, um, I had to kind of take a leap of faith because I, I just moved to San Diego. It was April of 2010. I had moved here almost on New Year's. Uh, I moved here on New Year's Day. Um, and so I was deciding whether I even wanted to stay in San Diego. And I had to decide if I, if I believed in myself enough as a front man, which I'd, I'd never done it before, but I had to believe in something I hadn't done. Um, I, had to believe, I had to believe in it and decide if I wanted to stay and try it out. And, and luckily I did. Um, I started the band. I met those guys in August. Um, the guys that I ended up starting Jagged Lines with. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started the band in October. And so we were, um, we started playing in October of 2010. And that was Jagged Lines. And then Brown Party Liquor came much later. That was in 2017. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it was just a good excuse to um, get my upright bass uh, a little bit of mileage too so it was I, you know, I was just playing with friends and we we were all drinkers and we'd like to get together and play drink and play on the weekend and we we just thought one weekend we just thought you know this sounds all right we should we should get out there and maybe make some money doing this and that's been good too so it's worked out really well nice nice well you have definitely been involved with both projects for a really long period of time You've been with um, Jagged Lines for, it's like, what, 13 years now? Well, 13 years, yeah. The, the band is surviving one way or another, but... Yeah, well, honestly, yeah. it's like, uh, dude, seriously, congratulations. I hope that one day I'll be able to be in the band that will last that long. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's like you said, like, if it's your passion, then you just can't help but chase it in some way. Agreed, yeah. I, I mean... You sort of, you don't really have a choice, you know? I mean, people say, oh, that's really great you did that, but what choice do I have? If I want to do this, I have to keep keep after it, right? So. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so um, I met you when you were a bassist for my dear friends, The Falling Doves. Right. And can you tell me how uh, you first met and then later came to work with Chris Leva and The Falling Doves? Sure, that's a um, that's a really great story. Um, so we had um, Chris and I both lived in Ocean Beach uh -huh. for um, for a while. I lived there for almost seven years. Chris lived there for about the same amount of time. Um, what's that? Sorry. And that's in San Diego. Was it like close to the area? Ocean Beach, San Diego. That's right. Um, and so, yeah, if you follow, if you follow the eight West, it'll dump right into ocean beach, California. So, uh, wherever you are, just follow the eight West. And when you get to the end, you'll be in ocean beach, which is lovely. Um, and so, um, the funny thing was that, uh, people, people sort of knew us, uh, Chris. And, and, and here's the funny thing about Chris too, is that Chris and I were living somewhat parallel lives in Ocean Beach. Uh, we weren't just living there. We didn't just kind of look alike. We didn't just kind of love the same stuff and style and music. Um, but we we were both front men with bands that we were working at. And he was an Uber driver. I was a Lyft driver. So people saw us driving around a bunch. Um, and it was there was a lot of confusion. And I understand, to be honest with you, I look at pictures of Chris sometimes. I'm like, oh, it's a great picture of me. That's Chris. <laughs> You know, I know. <laughs> I don't do the same thing. Even our parents confuse us. So, um, so, and we had we had a lot of situations where people were confusing him for me, me for him. You know, people would be like, "Oh, you guys had a really great show at the House of Blues last week," uh, and I was like, "Oh, um, thank you. Yeah, no, we played the we played the Casbah last week, but thank you. Yeah, you, that you must have been there. That's great." And they're like, "No, you were definitely at the House of Blues," uh, and I was like, "Sure, thanks. Yeah." Thanks. But, you know, like a lot of confusion. Right. And um, there was a really memorable time that Chris was actually out with a girl that he was dating. And some girl comes up to him and she's like, oh, so so this is what you're doing. That's why I never heard from you. Thanks a lot. And just was really super nasty. And uh, Chris was like, you know, left in a weird situation with his girlfriend. She was like, who's that? And he's like, I have no idea. There's this guy that looks just running around. He looks kind of like me, and is, I had nothing to do with it. And um, 
<laughs> a, lot of, a lot of good situations like that. So finally, um, you have to understand, this happened for years. Uh, and there were people who knew us both that were just sick of it. They were, they were like, how, how, Dre, how do you not know Chris Leva? Or Chris, how do you not know Dre? Like, you guys need to meet. Uh, and so the person who was most sick of that was her friend, Gail, who, Gail uh, Hopping, shout out to Gail Hopping, oh, yeah, who, um, yeah. I, I actually, I met Gail on a trip. Oh, good. Wild that I took, help me, it's been like four years now, Jesus. Yeah, it has been four years since I wow. took the trip because Chris actually invited me. And I very briefly met Gail there. Him and I are Facebook friends. But oh, good. I only met him on that one trip. I was there in, at, in Idlewild for like two days. A day and a oh, half. good. But yeah, I, I know who he is. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. Um, well, Gail is the reason. Gail is the reason that, that Chris and I know each other because he booked a show for his birthday and he got Jagged Lines and Falling Doves to play the show. And so um, when I walked in, uh, I saw Chris Leva for the first time face to face. And so um, I said to him, you know, you are a very, very handsome man. <laughs> and so, oh, goodness. Sorry, I keep hitting things that I shouldn't. There we go. I'm not good at Zoom. I don't do Zoom there very much in case you haven't noticed. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Um, and so, yeah, he booked the show. And, and, and so I said that to Chris and Chris thought it was really funny. He's like, Hey, why don't we do a song together? Let's do, let's do a song. I'm going to play, we're going to play last. So let's do a song right at the very end. And so we did, and we did champagne supernova. And since then it's been, um, it's just been lovely having a rock and roll brother. Nice. Nice. And so this show where you guys met Gail, what this was this, um, in San Diego, was it um, in the Palm Springs? Like where? Which venue was it at? Like where was it? Here at? in Ocean Beach, actually, it was. Um, it was at a, a now defunct, um, a now defunct venue called Mothers. It was a really small show that he um, just kind of made work. So, and it was cool. We were we were respectful about it because, you know, little spot, but why not? We'll have some fun with it, and we did. We had a blast. Nice, nice. I bet. And uh, and then like. So you said this was, um, what year was this in again? That's a good question too. Um, that was, I want to say the very end of 2018. Oh, I see. Yeah. So it wasn't I think. that long ago. And Not then, that long ago. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, wow. <laughs> Gosh. Yeah. And just, you actually met Chris, um, after I did, I've known Chris longer than you have. Ooh, look yeah. at that. Well, you know, we're brothers. We're separating at birth, so that's a little dicey. Sure is. Yeah, because Chris and I met at the very beginning of 2017. We met in oh, wow. 2017 at Maui Sugar Mill Salon. Oh, you guys met out there, of all places. Yeah, yeah. I came out there, and it was my first time at... Maui Sugar Mill. I came out there to see a friend play. She had an acoustic show, and um, she was playing on the same bill as the Falling Doves. And so, right. the, so at the very end of the night, like she and I were hanging out with a bunch of people by the bar, <clears throat> like right before I was about to go home. And Chris was standing in that crowd. And at one point, him and I just kind of like looked at each other and we started talking. And Shortly after that, we became friends on Facebook. I honestly, for the life of me, cannot remember when him and I became friends on social media, whether it was the actual night when we met or if it was like sometime after that. But next, just like a few months after, I think in, mm -hmm. like in June or something, I saw the Falling Doves play at the Whiskey. And Chris and I, oh. like, every, him and I have been hanging out like whenever the Falling Doves play in LA ever since. Oh, cool. That's good. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad. <laughs> That's yeah. a sweet little story. You have known him longer than I have at the Sugar Mill of all places too. Yeah, I know. I know. It's like, it's crazy. But honestly, Maui Sugar Mill is not as far from Los Angeles as so many people think it is. Like without traffic, it's only um, about a 20 minute drive. With traffic, it's longer, but that's the that's the thing that sucks about LA. 
Oh, right. Oh, okay. So you meant, okay, the one out here, because I thought you meant the one in, in actually in Maui. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, it's the <laughs> Muslim saloon at the um, bar in Persana. Right, right, right. Okay, yeah, I got you. Because mm -hmm. no, we, we did, we play, another, we, we play another sugar mill in Maui. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? There is? There is a Maui sugar mill in Maui, Hawaii? Yeah, yeah, there is. Yeah. yeah, we played it before. It's this little, it's this little spot, too. It's it's cool, but it's great. Is it like is it like exactly like the Maui Sugar Mill in Tarzana? Or I haven't been to the one in Tarzana, so I'm gonna have to go just to compare it and let you know. <laughs> you really should. You really should. I've been to the Maui Sugar Mill in Tarzana more times than I can count. I've been going there since 2017, and um, it's definitely a really cozy venue. I should try to explore some other places because, quite frankly. I do love the vibe and the music, but the crowd there is a little bit older than I would have liked. It's almost right. impossible to meet a guy there. And that's like half of the reason why I go out. Well, I do go out to see my friends and to relax, but lately I've been thinking that maybe I should really like try to meet someone. And right, right, yeah. You know, in Tarzana, as fun as it is, the crowd over there is definitely older most of the time, but you know, it's still, it's definitely one of my homes away from home in L.A. Right. Yeah. Maybe find a sugar daddy there or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's not exactly what I'm looking for. No. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. So, um, what states and countries have you toured in so far? Oh, wow. Um, okay, so we've toured, um, well, with Falling Doves, I've, I've done the most amount of touring, so let's let's do that one. Um, I've done, I mean, a ton of towns in England, um, Scotland, um, Germany, France, and uh, Australia with the Doves, and I played Puerto Rico, which feels like its own country, too just like Hawaii. Um, so we did those places. And then we played, uh, we played a couple of places too. We did, <laughs> we did a surprisingly wild tour in Nebraska. That's been the wildest tour that I've ever done with Chris, believe it or not. Not London, not Paris, not New York City. It was Nebraska. That was the craziest one. Um, and uh, we played Iowa and, of course, California. And then with Falling Duck or uh, with Jagged Lines, I've played um, all over California, you know, San Diego, um, San Francisco, LA, of course. Uh, we played uh, we played Nevada. We were in Vegas, of course. We played Arizona. So we, we've done a lot of stuff in the Southwest um, with Jagged Lines. And then um, I toured with this band back east. We played New York, Connecticut. Massachusetts, Rhode Island, um, that kind of stuff. So, so really, yeah, really those places. That, and that's about it. Um, I haven't done a ton of touring outside of that. So, well, it looks like, I mean, it sounds like you have done a ton of touring. <laughs> yeah, because like, maybe I've done enough, like, right? <laughs> you just listed like, like, um, I don't know, <laughs> places. Honestly, it's a long list, <laughs> long, long list. And, right. And <laughs> that you said about Nebraska actually it brings me to my next question what were some of your best and worst touring experiences and I definitely want to hear about Nebraska because if when you said that that experience was the most memorable not like Europe not I don't know Hawaii but <laughs> what happened in Nebraska the the wildest experience not the best not the worst it was just the wildest one I see. um because in you know in a lot of places um you know if you if you're playing in london if you're playing in in new york um you know it's a lot it's a lot to get people to um to come on out you know people are busy and, and there's a lot of choices there's a lot of things to do but when you're playing in a, in a smaller place people um you kind of are the big deal there and so and you have to act accordingly which is kind of a responsibility too um and so we had we had a lot of people come out um for a few small town shows um we played um what's it called um 
we played in a little tiny town called Sutherland, um, which is actually Gail Hopping's hometown. That's how we ended up there. Oh, wow. And that that place ended up being just a, a really wild time. It was really fun. Um, and then we played in um, a couple of the spots in, in Nebraska, stuff that you would expect. Uh, and then we played uh, the wildest show I think we've ever played, just just wild from beginning to end, and, and it's just the, the circumstances around it. Um, we played for a guy in Iowa who, um, who you know, it's right next door to Nebraska. And uh, we, we had another gig lined up, and the guy was like, well, if you guys are playing that weekend, I'll double whatever you're making. He had just met us. He had met us at diner. Oh, wow. And he's like, I'll double whatever you're making, and I'll, um, and I'll, uh, and we'll have a much better stage, we'll have a much better time, and I'll have people there for you, and you know, you'll 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 be treated like royalty. And so we thought, sure, you know, this guy, this guy's crazy, but sure, he's gonna pay us more. And holy crap, it was a gigantic strip club, but also a music venue, oh, wow. and so they were just kind of connected by like a by like a hallway, and so both play, both sections had a bar. And they offered us like everything in the world. Like the guy was like, can we get you, can we get your party favors? Can we get you more drinks? Can we get you, you guys want a girl? Like, which girl do you want? And we are like, we're, we're just here to do a show, man. Like we're, we're not here to, we're not here to move in. Um, but we had some of our, some of our craziest stories happen there. Um, that was, that was one of our, um, <laughs> just all our craziest stories. We partied with those people too. They, they all, um, lined up they bought every last bit of merch we left there without stick without even one sticker or one t-shirt left wow. um, because they bought everything and um and then after that they took us out partying they brought us back to their place and it was their place was this huge house uh that pool and all these all these people and all these motorcycles and all this crazy crap and we ended up partying with them until about maybe four or five in the morning um when the gunshots started so that's when we got out of there <laughs> Yeah, they had a. Um, they were all um, someone that was kind of like a, a higher up with their group of friends was a was a drug dealer, oh. and so I guess there were problems with the with whatever had just gone down, and so they they were. Uh, and this was at yeah. the house that you guys were like partying at until five in the morning. This wasn't like a house like a few doors down or on the same street. No, no, this was a this was a house in a neighborhood. Um, but, you know, the neighbors were just used to it and people were just kind of used to going crazy. Um, in fact, a lot of the neighbors were there. So it was it was that kind of a party. But, uh, yeah, when the gunshots started, we left. <laughs> we're like, OK, that's enough. Very nice. Thank you very much. We're out of here. So <laughs> oh my um, that definitely sounds insane. And um, yeah, that was that was great. And this was when you were touring with the Falling Doves. That, you guys that was did. with the falling doves, yeah, for, for sure. sure. I well now at least I have some sort of an idea of what goes on uh, <laughs> with those guys when they're not playing in LA because like honestly, whenever they do play here, like here in Los Angeles, it's always just like me going. I'm going to the club. I'm hanging out with um, <clears throat> Greg and Carol, his wife, and then I watch right. I watch Chris and Mike and Greg set up or whatever, I see them play, and then we just sort of like hang out and drink at the other night. It definitely wasn't like, I never experienced anything that like that was like that, you know, <laughs> because that was like on a whole other level. So. Right, right. Yeah, it is. I don't recommend. Okay. There we go. Sorry, I keep doing that. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, sorry, what was it you were saying? Which one? So what did what did you start to say like right before you cut out again? Oh, um, yeah, no. That's the that's the thing is like hopefully hopefully our shows aren't like that all the time because uh, it would be just a health hazard. I think it would shorten our lifespan a little bit. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean the drinking and the drugs. Um, that's <laughs> limit that, but you know the overall vibe and like everything else i've actually always wanted to visit a strip club mainly male but i would also go into like you know where where they have girls but sure. i'm waiting for like the right you know opportunity when i would actually be able to go with all my friends because like obviously i wouldn't want to go by myself Not right right 
male strip club. It'll have to be like the right party atmosphere. Well, maybe someday that dream can come true. I mean, Greg loves those places, so maybe he'll take you sometime. <laughs> oh my gosh, really? I had no idea. Wow. Yeah. He's... I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to mention that to him next time the Doves play in LA. Yeah, he's he's earned the name Slut Bucket um, from from that when we actually from Nebraska, that wild tour in Nebraska. That's where he earned the name Slut Bucket. So maybe you'll ask him about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, can you, okay. So is there like a story that goes with how he got that nickname? <laughs> well, um, there's a lot I can't tell about that story. But the things that I can tell, it was in Nebraska. Mm -hmm. um, it was, oh, man, maybe it was, it might have been even later than the other story. I think it might have been super early in the morning. And um, there were there were a lot of fans who were there for Greg, uh, to be honest. There were a lot of a lot of females that were really there for, for Greg. And one of them, um, she she'd had a, a few drinks too. She was definitely a few drinks in, and we'd been partying all night. And um, she just said, What's the deal with Greg? At, and and uh, we told him we told her all about him and and she just kind of laughed and, and we're like, What? And and she's just like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good story it's about Slut Bucket over there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, that, so technically that girl um, was the one who coined the phrase Slut Bucket. She was the one, right. She she was, <laughs> I, I don't remember her name, but um, yeah, she was the one who, who inspired that. Well, I'm definitely going to ask Greg about that next time. That's definitely <laughs> Story. I'm glad that I decided to do an interview with you because otherwise I never would have heard any of these details. So like <laughs> <laughs> definitely not Chris because he doesn't talk to me about things like that. He jokes around a lot. Sometimes him and I talk on the phone, but honestly, he has never told me that story. So I'm glad. Oh yeah, yeah. There's I mean, there's so many stories too. In his defense, I mean, a lot of these stories are ridiculous. And he'll tell you a lot of ridiculous stories, but um it's just hard to it's just hard to keep a track keep track of them all, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I bet, I bet. So, um, can you tell me a little bit what it's like to be a rock and roll musician in this day and age? Oh man, you know it's beautiful. Um, it's really, really beautiful. I I don't think I could ask for a a better um, a better job, really. Uh, it sucks. The benefits are terrible. The pay is awful, and um, the work is endless. And um, you have every kind of difficulty and issue. But um, but I think it's really important right now. Um, a lot of people say it's defeating. A lot of people say it's kind of um, demoralizing, and I can understand that. But if you look at it that way, um, I don't know. Maybe it's just because I was brought up with punk rock. So I think a lot of the people who say it's demoralizing and this and that they're they're not used to their music being completely um glossed over and ignored and criticized and forgotten about you know and and with punks i mean we've grown up with that that's 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 all we've had is all we've known is just people um bagging on your music and ignoring it and bashing it and undermining it um so we you know being being into punk um that's sort of been my experience uh, and so I don't I don't see it as anything different than I see it as business as usual. It's it's a tough time because you realize too that um, in the United States not everybody's really uh, into it as much. I'm so sorry I don't have a reliable way of holding that. <laughs> um, but I was saying uh, how uh, we don't we don't have as much of um, we don't have as much of an of an audience for it here in the United States and. Um, it's huge in England. It's huge in Australia. Um, the Japanese love our culture. Our culture is a is a culture that doesn't slow down. We don't stop to look back. Uh, we just create and create and create, and that's that's how the United States has always worked. Um, and so, and, and it's fine. You know, it happens. Um, other places appreciate it more than we do. So it, it's a little bit difficult, specifically being in the United States, um, because you know that you know if if we were doing the same things that we were doing that we were doing now, if we were doing those things 20 years ago, we would be, you know, doing all sorts of, um, you know, maybe enjoying bigger opportunities, maybe doing more things, um, you know, and so now it's a little bit more limited, which is fine, but uh, it's still great because when you reach people 
they're they're hungry for it they really want it and it's something that we have to do you know it's it's a it, i feel like chris I, I speak for chris that way too i think where we we feel that it's music is important for connection uh for camaraderie for reaching people and um doing that via rock and roll is always going to be an honor and a privilege to be honest Yeah, that definitely gave me a lot to think about because um, the main reason why I decided, like the main reason why I started singing like six years ago when I was 25. And honestly, I still have hopes of, you know, joining the band someday soon. And the main reason why I started doing um, music journalism and like blogging is because of my love for rock and roll because that's the genre of, genre of music that I have always been the most passionate about. And right. I got really into rock and roll when I was in my early 20s, when I first started reading rock star biographies. And honestly, those people just have such fascinating lives. And then I think that by the time I reached like my mid to late 20s, I just got so like enamored with the atmosphere. So, and like, honestly, um, it's kind of like a romanticized notion, but sometimes, sometimes I do wish that I lived in like the 60s, 60s, 60s or the 80s. Yeah, like I right. that things were a lot different. Back then. Um, you know, there's um, fewer people use internet, there's no social media, you'd have to watch commercials on TV, there was no Netflix, no Amazon Prime among a few other things but sometimes like a part of me wishes that it would like in that era but um hmm. yeah like it's definitely um i don't think that i really have much say in this because i don't really know all that much about like what kind of music really sells like in today's environment like obviously like it's mostly all about like the indie bands and like the pop music and stuff but honestly, I feel like rock and roll is not as underappreciated in the States, like as you say it is. Because like in Los Angeles, I have a long list of friends who play in rock bands. And maybe like their number of followers is not like as necessarily high as I think it is. But basically the bottom line is, um, as far as I know, like rock and roll is still alive. Oh sure, sure. Yeah. What what I mean what I mean by that though is like, you know, if you if you're on the bus with a bunch of drunken people, a bunch of drunken young people on a Friday night, um, you know, and they're 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 drunk and going home, um, you know, they're singing they're singing Dua Lipa. They're singing <laughs> uh, you know, they're singing like a lot of modern stuff that really isn't rock and roll. If you're in Ireland, if you're in Australia, and you have the same group, you know, similar group of people, kind of going home and singing music. I mean, they're they're singing the Killers, they're singing, um, you know, Emil and the Sniffers, they're singing all sorts of stuff like that, you know, because it hasn't slowed down for them. Um, really like the way that we were about about rock. I mean, the, the way that we are about rock and roll music is not the way that we were about it uh, 25 years ago, you know, and and that's that's fine. I mean, it, it's just the thing that happens. You can't fight it. You can't, whatever. But, um, but I feel like I feel like that culture hasn't disappeared everywhere. Whereas in the United States, it's it's at least dampened a bit, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. 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 Well, hopefully it will come back. Hopefully, yeah. I mean, you know, it, it is what it is. I I feel proud of it. Like I said, though, you know, I feel proud because I I think at this moment, um. You can you really if you really love something, you see it through, in its in its worst. You know if you if you love a person if you love if you love a thing, um, you know you you know that there's going to be bad days and you know that you're you're just going to be ready for it. And to be honest, I mean I know that I know that it's not um, the most glamorous time to be a rock musician, but this is the time where I think people need it the most. Uh, people need what we're doing the most, uh, maybe more than. You know, if it was 1988 or 1995 or 1972, you know, um, I think people need it more because people can say, you know, people in other countries can say, oh, look, no, they're doing it. Look, that's great. Look at look at that band. They're great. Um, or 
you know, or, or even just, you know, even just Americans are like, no, that's a great band. That's cool. Like, we're, we're glad that's a thing. That's, that's cool. Keeping it alive, you know, and I don't mind that. I, I, I think that's a, I think that's a great thing. I mean, if you love something, like I said, you know, you'll be there for it when it sucks and rock and roll needs us, you know, it's been good to me. It's done a lot for me. And so I, you know, I'm happy to be here. Even if I'm the, even if I'm the last guy doing it, I don't really care. I, I, I love it. You know, I'll do this till I die because it's just, it's just what I love. Yeah, yeah, it's like exactly what I said earlier about like me seeing the food this whole time because I've been working on like blogs since um well for the past two years since like February one and sure. I have been into rock and roll even longer than that. I mean, I've been seeing bands play live in the like clubs for the past what six seven years. Mm -hmm. It hasn't gone anywhere yet, so. You know. Yeah, yeah, totally. And hopefully, hopefully it won't quite like that, you know, not quite so dramatically like that, too. But. And last question. So what oh. advice would you give to anyone who's trying to start a rock band right now? Or um, I would say uh, never, ever, 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 ever give up. Don't give up. Um, people need to hear it. People want to hear it. And, uh, you know, even if even if people just want to do hear other things right now or you run across troubles, there's, there's going to be so, so many obstacles doing this. Um, you have to love it. You have to love it. And, that, and loving it will get you past the worst of it because there will be a lot of bad days. There'll be a lot of things that you won't like, uh, a lot of things that are not glamorous. But don't ever give up because that dream, that whatever you see in your head, when you wanted to start a band, that's there. It's going to happen. It's already, it's already out there. Um, you just have to plug yourself in, and you have to do the time um, to to find your way there. But you will. You absolutely will. And um, I would just say, don't ever, ever, ever give up. That would be my best advice on that. That's really good advice. Uh, that's really good advice. And uh, Trey, honestly, I really needed to hear that because. Um, I have had this notion of being in a band for years now, and, and right. I first got it back when I <clears throat> had this friend who was trying to make it a musician in LA. She stopped doing music since then, and she has her own podcast now, actually. But like back when she and I were hanging out, I was constantly going to her shows, and she was always singing original songs, and like. Yeah hearing her perform and like hearing her doing what she was doing like really inspired me like actually it really sort of like tapped into like my inner you know subconscious that I kind of realized that well it's not just some like recreational uh, thing that I have with music I don't just listen to a lot of music because of it, like relaxing I actually really love this and I don't ever want to let go of that dream for the rest of my life, even though I know it's going to take a long time before I, before I actually learn how to sing properly, before I'll ever be able to be in a band. And, you know, I'm like, I'm getting older, but I, right. back when I was like 25, when I first started, when I first made the decision to start taking voice lessons again for the first time since high school, I made like a pact with myself, like I said to myself, no matter what happens, don't give this up because honestly, like there is no guarantee that um, you have to keep practicing and you have to keep trying because one day it's going to take off. Right, right. Yeah, and enjoy the trip. Enjoy the journey. That's a big part of it too, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I have definitely done many great things since, since then, and I have plans to do many other great things. And um, thank you for the advice. Not sure. Thank you. I yeah. Didn't to do that. Is that sorry? I didn't. I missed what you said there. Oh, uh, sorry. I said thank you for let. Thank you for telling me not to give up because I certainly do not intend to do that. Good, good. That's important. Sure is. Sure is. Okay, well, <laughs> we've been at this for like an hour and 15 minutes. 
Wow, that happened, yeah, that moved quickly. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun, Dre. Wow. Hmm. This was definitely a really, really great interview. So thank you so much for being on my show. And dude, next time you're in LA, let me know. We'll go out, we'll party. And hopefully I'll see you play live, maybe with the Falling Doves sometime soon. I hope so soon. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Wonderful being here. No problem. Thank you for being here. Thanks. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Andre. Bye. Bye, Bye now. <laughs>